de muchos colores le gustan a mí. So when did you meet Cesar Chavez? Oh, I met him over here. At the CSO? Yeah, at the CSO. And my brother was very, very involved with Cesar. He helped Cesar organize the union. My younger brother, I, I call him Pete, but his name is Alex. He helped Cesar organize the union and, you know, talk to people and bring them together and mm -hmm. talk to them about organizing. And uh, at the time, I was at, at uh, Arts and Crafts. Mm -hmm. I was going to school there. And then I left. And during that period, they had this the thing. The CSO. Mm -hmm. And I got involved with this design. Because my brother told me, well, my, my, my brother is an artist. Yeah, you, know? <laughs> you carry the burden, <laughs> yeah. right? You are the artist, so you yeah. have to do all this. And, and so, so I do that stuff. But uh, anyway, that's the way it was. Before the first issue was ever formed, Caesar Chavez and Tony Orendine and probably Gil Padilla, probably Dolores, I'm not sure who all were involved in the first issue had discussed the name, the type of newspaper they wanted. They wanted a small paper that would be cheap and could be distributed in little towns and barrios all up and down the county, all up and down the Central Valley. And so they came up with the idea of El Malcriado, the child that just didn't respect authority. It was kind of the bad child that, um, well, not necessarily bad, but just didn't accept its place in life, didn't go along with the hierarchy of the world that was to be imposed on it. Caesar was ready to start a Macriado right then. He had the name, he had the idea, this is something our members need to have, is this newspaper. And he put out the first issue, and I didn't like it much. Caesar had done the page layouts by himself, it, it looked like kindergarten, and it contained uh, news and information and a few advertisements from people connected with the Farm Workers Association, but it was a beginning. It had one aspect to it that was really good. With the help of a friend of his, invented cartoon characters. The cover had the character Don Sataco. People said, says I talked to you and then you created this characters yeah. or was he he had something in mind and then you guys talked together how that yeah, happened no well yeah he wanted don to taco first and then i said well what about the farm worker and the contractor i said well yeah they were the bad guys you know mm -hmm. they whipped the farm workers to work the farm workers are pulling the bad guys what we called the bad guys that's what we went on strike i think it was a collaborative effort because Luis was the writer. Correct, but Luis said that he took his characters from his drawing. Yeah. And so, yeah. so yeah. it's not That's that he I'm... created Don Sotaco. Don Sotaco was created by Andy Sermini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm saying, yeah. I'm just saying that it was a collaborative effort as oh, it with went. Caesar, through. yeah. See, yeah. Caesar had the idea. He, he, he wanted to show these guys as taking advantage of the worker. So when, when you draw Patroncito, where did you get your idea of drawing the Patroncito that way? Like this fat guy with the glasses and the hat. Yes, there were some they that were. looked just that's like, they were like that. Yeah, that's what they were. They, were, they thought they were American cowboys. Yeah. You know, and they, they, they had all these little Mexican guys working for them. Uh, it, it really teed me up. It wasn't just the ones who owned the ranch. There was a lot of mayordomos that were Mexican. Oh, yeah. That did that. That looked like that. Oh, yeah. Because they paid him. Uh, Don Sotaco was a dummy. Mm -hmm. Don Sotaco was played as a dummy. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he, he did everything that the farm workers wanted, and he, he never complained. Mm -hmm. You know, he was just 
did it. I imagine a short guy with uh, patches on his pants and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. This is the union member. He's not a heroic guy, you know. He's not a real young guy. He's kind of middle-aged. He's kind of downtrodden. Um, he's been working all his life and he's never gotten anywhere, and he's never going anywhere, and it's not his fault. And then, whose fault is it? <laughs> Caesar and Andy, I know, had put a lot of thought into these characters before they ever did the first issue. And using these personifications of positions in the economic life of uh, the farm workers, you could say a lot. You have to remember that many of these people were not really fluent in written English or written Spanish. And the ideas had to be presented very graphically. And so the first two issues both had these cartoon covers. The first one was Don Sotaco, the second was Don Coyote. And the third edition goes back to revolutionary Mexican art. And Caesar used a lot of this in the early editions, Caesar and, and Tony. And I think Tony was also quite involved in these early editions, Tony Orendine. I saw that the tradition that we were working with was the tradition of the Mexican Revolution because all the uh, members of the uh, Farm Workers Association were Chicanos. Many of them had relatives in Mexico. Many of the old people still remembered the revolution. Even though we were in a different country, a different situation, I felt that the, the feeling of that cause could be used in our cause. There was a, a writer, Flores Magón, who did a newspaper out of Los Angeles, yeah, I think, in, in Tijuana. They were familiar with that and the tremendous impact that it had had. They also subscribed to a paper that was being printed in Tijuana or Ensenada called the Comadre de la Contora. El Macriado, when I came on, which was like August and September, El Macriado was better known than the association. This was in little stores all up and down the valley, and people would buy it, and Caesar was the editor of El Macriado, was how they knew Caesar. I mean, and, and he had a little group down in Delano. He had an office in Delano. We had an office at 130 Albany, down the street. We had our own house, and all our funds were our own, and if any check came to us that said United Farm Workers, we took it down to the other office, gave it to them. We never cashed checks that unless they were to the farm worker press or El Macriado. The guy that was editing at that time, Bill Escher, had his eye on my little 1935 Ford pickup truck because he thought, oh, I could use that to deliver the paper. So he began organizing me to go to Delano and help out on his newspaper. Caesar had been impatient, and I had taken three, I think three months to complete what I was doing in San Francisco where I had lived previously before I could come and work with him. Uh, it was a huge change in my life to tell him, yes, I'll come and do this. I know how to do it. And it took me a while before I could complete what I was doing and come there. And, and I was editor from beginning issue number two. And I moved down there the day after the Filipinos had gone on strike. And Bill Escher had told me, oh, there's plenty of work in, in Delano in the fall and the grapes. You won't have any time making money. But of course, once the strike started, uh, there wasn't any question about working in the grapes. So in 1965, I had been working in the grape fields, and then I had an accident where I got hit by a car and broke my leg. So I had been home, and then we started hearing about how there was a, a union, you know, because all of us were very dissatisfied with the way we were treated. You know, I was earning like a 90 cents an hour. Very seldom was there cool drinking water. There was no toilets in the fields, nothing. And again, if you complained, they said, if you don't like it, quit. There's somebody else that will take your job. So I didn't think there was anything we could do about it, even though we were unhappy with that. And, but then one day, when I went to a, a store, I picked up a copy of a, a publication called El Malcriado. So I looked at it, it seemed very interesting, it was 10 cents, so I bought one, took it home, and I read it. And it was about this thing called the National Farm Workers Association, uh, which I had never heard of. And it had stories in there about how it was a union, uh, an organization 
to protect uh, uh, workers' rights, farm worker rights. One day I'm at home and my mother and my sister, and you know, I was, I had a cast on my leg because of my broken leg. And I was watching I Love Lucy uh, on television. My mother and my sister walked in and say, we're on strike, we're on strike. And I said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean you're on strike? Yeah, the Filipinos walked out and we walked out with them. So we're on strike. We're demanding that we be paid a dollar and, and uh, 40 cents an hour. And so we're on strike. And I was so excited. I mean, you know, because we had been hearing about, the, about a strike that had happened in Coachella. And, and it was like a, some real sense of something big was going to happen. The AWOC structure was also based on the foremen, who were, again, older Filipinos. They were union members. The crew was loyal to them. If the foreman went out on strike, the crew would go with him. The crews were very tightly cohesive and our union was predominantly Mexican-American or Mexican. What was our relationship to this strike? We decided to call a meeting. I mean, gosh, what could be more all-American? You call a meeting. <laughs> I'd barely gotten there. The job of the Macriado is to get out the notice of this meeting all over the Central Valley. It was called for the 16th of September, which was Mexican Independence Day. And it was in the Catholic Church Hall in Delano. And if you go there, um, all the windows were donated, the stained glass windows were donated by the growers. And the priest was very neutral. And the idea of having a strike vote in his hall, but Caesar assured him, oh no, this is to calm passions and we just want to make sure there's no violence <laughs> and mm, whatever. And the workers got there, and Epifanio Camacho gave this tremendous speech about we are the sons of Zapata, and the land, like the air, like the water, belongs to the people and those who work it. In those early issues of the paper, the word strike and the word union were never mentioned once. And the reason for that was nobody would take it seriously. Any, anyone would laugh at it if it were mentioned. I don't think there had ever been a farm labor strike in the history of California that had been a success. I was working on the Macriado, so if I wasn't on the picket line, I was putting out the paper. We had a two-person staff and then a, two um, young students from a Catholic high school in Bakersfield came to help us, Mary Murphy and Marsha Brooks. And basically the four people put out a staff in a room that's probably from the light back to here. And at the end of the summer, they had decided to bring out an English edition, especially geared to the young Chicanos that didn't read Spanish. And there were some blacks and some Filipinos that were beginning to get interested in the union. That, so that we were going to bring out an English edition. And there were 2,000 copies in Spanish, and we were going to bring out 1,000 in English. Soon after the strike began, of course, we had picket lines and roving picket lines trying to bring workers out. And we had both the picket lines in the fields, and very quickly, or at least by October, were already sending people to San Francisco and Los Angeles. Certainly by November, following the grapes and trying to interrupt the marketing process in the city. And where did this idea come from? How did this evolve? This idea came from us. They're not going to be picking the field because nobody's there no more. So then we all started going out on the white cut of the grape. We started sending out people on for several reasons, several things. One, to raise money. Two, to raise support. And three, to boycott, chase the, the, the grapes. We had been having meetings like every night. We'd come home from the picket line and we'd have meetings, right? And it would be easier and the organizers and all of the pickets. And I remember we were so frustrated because every time we'd get people out, the growers bring other people. We were getting so frustrated. And the boycott seemed to be working, but we felt like we needed something else. So then Caesar and everybody brainstormed, and we came up with the idea of a march to Sacramento, hoping that on the march we could gather enough support so that the legislators could, uh, could see that we were serious about this strike. And hopefully we could get uh, laws to just allow us to have elections. 
because all we wanted was elections to find out of whether the workers wanted a union or not. Once we had elections, you know, we knew we could win because we knew that everybody wanted a union. I personally marched on that first day and it went out towards Rich Grove, but I didn't march the whole day. And then I marched two days later up in Fresno County and I remember the march into Parlier and the rally in Parlier was one of the most moving experiences in my life. And then I marched the final two days into Sacramento. And as I saw the march from the point of view of the, the newspaper, El Macriado, this was a chance, again, to use what had happened in Delano to inform the farm workers in the rest of the state. The strategy of the march into these little towns also was very closely connected to the Macriado because we had subscribers in each of these little towns. And the advance organizers for the march would go into Selma and they'd have the membership list and there'd be five or ten members and they'd have the subscription list and there'd be another five or ten that weren't yet members but were subscribers. And these became the organizers in the town to organize the food, to organize places to sleep, to put the town together so that it could receive the march as the march came in. And as we came in to Parlier, because the Macriado had been distributed in that little town for a year, the people already knew the characters. They knew Caesar, they knew Dolores, they knew Gilbert, they knew the strike, they knew the boycott, they knew Shenley. They were informed as to the issues. Then by 66, Bill Escher more or less moved out of the actual day-to-day -day work of the Macriado, so I was the editor. Late 66, into 67, there was a guy named Daniel de los Reyes. My Spanish was so bad that if I could find someone else to be to do the actual writing in Spanish, I would bring him in. And I certainly didn't have any power trip problems about me wanting to be the boss. <laughs> I just, you know, you wanted to get the paper out. We weren't winning the strike in the fields. If we were going to win, it was going to be the boycott. So as the union began focusing on the cities, the Macriado became important we were still distributing it to these little towns, mm -hmm. but it was much more important for the boycotters distributing it in the cities. cities. And so, so it yeah, shift. it did change. It did shift. And who is our audience by? By 1967, our audience is the boycott. It isn't farm workers at all. And in fact, we stopped printing in Spanish, and then the paper folded entirely in the summer of 1967. The last issues, you open them up wide. It's a different format entirely. And Marcia Sanchez ended up doing those in 67. Yeah. And in August, the paper finally went bankrupt. And Caesar was happy to see it go under, because by that time, it was more problem for him than it was worth it to save it. We'd print something like this. Someone would complain to Caesar. Caesar would call us in and say he got the complaint. Usually it wasn't even that Caesar agreed with them or that we shouldn't print this. It was that he'd gotten the complaint. And we had to be aware that people that were supporting us were complaining about El Macriado. It was over politics, especially democratic politics. It was over the Vietnam War, especially because the Democratic Party and the AFL-CIO supported the war 100%. Then it got involved with the Teamsters. The Teamsters entered in competing with us. Well, there were unions that were allied with the Teamsters, like the longshoremen and the auto workers, that didn't want us saying things against the Teamsters. Well, we were fighting with the Teamsters. Well, not all the Teamsters are bad. Well, how to, how to put it. I noticed one thing, and just glancing through them, the association was of local people. The newspaper was, it was the voice of the farm workers. And when I came on, La Voz del Campesino to me meant you represent the voices of these different elements. When I was working for El Macriado, I thought, God, I was really lucky because this was a publication that was being performed by strikers and, and volunteers that was going out to the general public that was telling a story about what was happening and and I was able to add photographs to that story. Just a very grassroots, family-level thing that we're all in this together, and this looks like a little insignificant issue, but 
it is significant. In 1965, my nana, who still lived in, in the valley, my grandmother, my dad's mom, sent my dad a copy of El Malcriado. And I discovered that there was something afoot in, back in my home turf, back in Delano, and back in early March. Don Sotaco, I think you saw some of the images sketched by Andy Cermeño and Don Coyote and the Patroncito appeared in copies of uh, El Malcriado. I saw that and I said, this can be dramatized. I said, those are my characters. Mm -hmm. I need to do this. And so what is this Cesar Chavez up to? This is the summer of 65. So the first chance I got, I went to Delano and I met the Dolores first. And then I talked to Cesar and pitched him the idea of a theater of by and for farm workers. And he said, well, you know, there's no money to do theater in Delano. There, there are no actors in Delano. There isn't any place to, or time to rehearse. Uh, do you still want to do it? And I said, absolutely, Cesar, what an opportunity. Cesar was absolutely right. There was no place to perform. We had the picket line. So El Teatro Campesino began on the picket line. You see the early actos that, that you've seen in the, in the images. And the actos uh, became then the seed of El Teatro Campesino. But the fact is that when you believe in something, anything can happen, miracles can happen, but they're tiny miracles that come from people. These are the things that can change the world. And I felt that I was part of a movement. I was a was seed of a movement, and, and I was able to seed it with the arts. Our, our objective was to bring the power of the arts, of self-expression, into the huelga, into the union, and to the lives of farm workers.